Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. Let's talk a little bit about magnesium. Let's talk about how we ingest magnesium through our diet and supplements and even through water and what happens to the magnesium in our body. What role does it play within our body? First thing is, we need to look at magnesium in the periodic table with all the other atoms and elements. So we have hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluoron, neon, sodium, magnesium. Now if we separate them out into their relevant rows and columns of the periodic table, what you're going to find is this. If we were to count the numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, magnesium is the 12th atom in the periodic table. And what that actually means is this. Magnesium has 12 protons, which are positive things, and it has 12 electrons, negative things. This is another thing. Biologically, so when they're in the earth, they're fine like this. When they are ingested and they're in our body, they hate being in this form. At least, some of them hate being in this form. This last row here, they're called the noble gases, right? They're noble, they love being like themselves. They're the high and mighty, everyone wants to be like the Royal Society here on the very right hand side. That means magnesium, which is number 12, wants to be like its closest noble gas, which is neon. So if we were to draw neon up, it is number 10. So it has 10 protons, 10 electrons. Magnesium wants to be like neon. Now the protons sit inside the atom, right? So you've got the atom, nucleus, and then you've got all the things floating around. The protons are inside, they're non-exchangeable. You can't play around with those. But outside floating around are the electrons, you can exchange those. So for magnesium to be like neon, it can only play around with its electrons. If neon has 10, magnesium has 12, well, magnesium loses two of its electrons and becomes 10. Now, if you compare the 12 positive and the 10 negative and put them together, you're left with two positive protons, which means biologically when you ingest magnesium as an atom, it becomes this charged form. This is called an ion. This is its ionized form. Heard of electrolytes before? Electrolytes turn into ions. When you drink electrolytes, like Gatorade, Powerade for example, what happens is the salts turn into ions. And it's ions that have biologically active roles in the body. This is what does all the stuff in the body, right? This charged form of magnesium. All right, now the next thing is, when we ingest the magnesium, we ingest it through a number of different ways. One way that we ingest magnesium in significant amounts is actually in water. There's heaps of inorganic salts in water. There's heaps of inorganic minerals in water. And so that's one way for us to get our biologically active ionized magnesium. Another way is through our diet. Now, this includes legumes, nuts, dairy, dairy, that's how you spell it. And again, it's going to give us magnesium. And then we also get it in supplements. Now, here's the thing. The way we get it in our supplements and our diet is Magnesium is in a salt form. What's a salt? So a salt is something like sodium chloride. That's table salt. We know that when you put a salt, so this is basically the definition of a salt. You put a salt in water, and what happens is it splits apart. Sodium goes that way, chloride goes that way, but they become charged, right? Positive sodium, negative chloride. Together, the charges cancel each other out, and now with this inert sodium chloride, separate like this because of water, that's a salt. So when magnesium is in a salt form, there are different salt forms of magnesium that you find is magnesium citrate, magnesium malate. They're probably two of the most common you find in supplements. And in the diet, or at least that we get from the soil or the earth, is gonna be magnesium carbonate. Regardless, what happens is when they are in water, remember most of us is water, when they go into water, they produce the ionized form of magnesium. Now we've got our active form of magnesium. What do we do with it in the body? All right, so we're obviously ingesting this. So when we ingest it, you 
Here's our oral cavity. We're ingesting it down the esophagus. Once it's in the esophagus, it's gonna to go to the stomach. Once it's at the stomach, it goes to the duodenum, first part of the small intestines, and the rest of the small intestines. Then it's gonna to go to the large intestines and so forth. All right. 20 to 70% of the magnesium we ingest gets absorbed at the small intestines, right? Gets absorbed at the small intestines. What's it getting absorbed into? It's getting absorbed into the bloodstream. What happens to the rest of this magnesium? It gets pooped out. Okay? In the bloodstream, magnesium can then float around to different parts of the body and it's going to jump out of the bloodstream and go to different tissues. Now of these tissues, what you're going to find is that greater than 50% of our magnesium is actually stored in bones. This is a great storage area for our magnesium and most of it is exchangeable. So if we need magnesium, we can pull it out of our bones. It's actually stored in bones with calcium, which is another Ca2+. It's another charged ion. A charged ion is actually called a cation. A negatively charged ion, so a positively charged cation, negatively charged is an anion. So 50% there. Now, what you're gonna find is the rest of our magnesium stores are sitting inside the cells. The rest is inside the cells of our body, all right? Only 1% sits outside the cells of our body. And it's this 1% that sits outside the cells of our body which are really important biologically. All right, let's now have a look at the cells of our body. So, the roles that magnesium plays. First thing is this, magnesium inside the cell loves to bind to ATP. That's the energy currency. This is what makes us do everything. In actual fact, in humans, ATP will only do its thing if magnesium is bound to it and present. So magnesium is extremely important in ATP dependent reactions. This is energy production. That's one thing. Next thing is ATP is very important. So remember, inside you've also got heaps of potassium. So magnesium and potassium. Potassium is actually the most abundant intracellular positively charged ion. Magnesium is the second most abundant. Really important. Now, they're coupled. So often, so potassium fluxes and magnesium fluxes have an intrins uh, intrinsic link to them. Same happens with stores of magnesium in bones. Magnesium and calcium have a very intrinsic link. Now, if we look at the role of magnesium at the neuromuscular junction, this is getting muscles to contract, right? What you're gonna have is a neuron which is gonna fire off at a muscle end plate. Here's a muscle, right? Now, inside the muscle, you've got these little storage areas, these storage pits. Now, these storage pits are called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and they are filled with calcium. Now, what's so important about calcium in muscles? Without calcium, muscles will not contract. So you've actually got all these filaments here inside muscle that need to shorten. And they shorten by contracting, sorry, binding to each other and sliding across called the sliding filament theory. You need calcium to jump out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, go to these sliding filaments called actinomycin, and get them to bind to each other so they can slide across. Great thing is, what magnesium does is it helps throw, so when you've got the calcium that's jumped out to allow for muscles to contract, magnesium takes the calcium that's been used and throws it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it helps replenish the stores of lost calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum so we can have another muscular contraction. So that's really important. What's another important point is that magnesium actually seems to strangely be an antagonist to calcium at the end of a neuron. So when a neuron releases a neurotransmitter, for example, you're gonna have all these little vesicles, these bubbles, 
filled with something called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine tells muscles to contract. Really important, that's the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. Now you're gonna have all these bubbles, vesicles filled with acetylcholine. They won't release until calcium tells them to release. And then you've got acetylcholine floating around here. That then goes to the muscle, and then the muscle will contract. Here's the thing, magnesium for some reason inhibits calcium doing that. It's an antagonist. And this seems to be important in the sense that it helps to mitigate or control contraction that's mediated by calcium. And another thing is cell death. So when our cells die, it's often due to calcium fluxes and magnesium stops this. So magnesium is anti-apoptotic. It's an anti-death stimulating chemical in the body. I think we might leave it there because that's a lot of stuff.